Okay, hi everybody. My name is Ben Douglas. I am the Director of Admission at St. James School in Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, just a little bit of quick background on St. James because it will um, make, help everything make a little bit more sense later on. We are a small co-ed boarding and day school with about 220 students. Two, 20 of those students are in our eighth grade. The remaining 200 students are in our high school. Um, I have been in admissions since uh, 2007, uh, but this is only my second year at St. James, so still pretty new. Um, I have been in the boarding school world since 2000, um, but the first seven years I was on the West Coast and uh, in, in the academic uh, side of the house. Uh, this is Leo Marshall. I'm the Director of Admission at the Webb Schools. We're out here in California. Um, 400 students. I've been doing this business since 1987. So I've been in independent schools for almost 40 years. Um, more germane to this conversation, I've been going to China since about 2005. I do all the Chinese interviews and, and visits over there. Um, so that will be the perspective I will bring to that. We are pretty much overwhelmed with applicants from China, as you all are. So we, I'm interested in this in participating in this conversation. Great, thanks, Leo. Uh, my name is Chris Boner, and I'm the executive director at Vericant. Um, I've been in China since 2006, uh, but founded Vericant uh, at the end of 2010. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about what the game plan is for today. Uh, for the first quarter, we're going to take a look at China perspectives, so I'm going to lead that part. Then we're going to look at U.S. perspectives, which Ben will help us out on and Leo will chime in, uh, as with the school strategy in the third quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, it's up to all of you to help us out in the Q&A. Um, we're going to answer as many questions as we possibly can before the hour is up. So let's go ahead and start the first quarter. Now, before I begin, many people ask me, you know, Chris, why on earth did you move to China back in 2006? Uh, and the reason is because of this gentleman here, uh, Vladimir Talsig. This is a picture of him on the bun in Shanghai. If you look in the background, those two buildings are still there. One's a customs house and one's a bank. Um, and this is my grandfather. Uh, he left Czechoslovakia in the 1930s. Um, he was Jewish and was just escaped right before the Nazis came to power there. So I actually owe quite a lot to China as it, as it did protect my family uh, back uh, just before World War II. And um, that's why I'm just, uh, I love being over there. So what I'm going to try to do is provide perspective and give you an idea of what is happening in the minds uh, of the Chinese that you're working with. So we're going to take a look at parents. We're going to look at agents, and we're also going to take a look at applicants, as these are the three people that admission officers usually touch. And for each of these, we're going to have a quick profile. Uh, we're going to look at their motivations, and then also the challenges they face when they apply to uh, U.S. schools. So first, mom and dad. They are generally the same age as parents of American students that you're working with, uh, 35 to 50 years old. Um, geographically, they're generally coming from coastal China. This is uh, annual per capita income in China. You'll notice uh, the number one and two, that's Beijing and Tianjin. Uh, and then also along the coast, you can see Shanghai is that very dark blue. Um, this is where most of the wealth is con concentrated in China, and it kind of peters off as you head west towards Tibet. So generally about 80% that we see in our interviews of these applicants are coming from these main coastal cities. The parents lived through or were very young during the uh, Cultural Revolution. They grew up in a very different China uh, than their children have. So they have um, a little bit of a different viewpoint than, than their children might when, when considering studying abroad. Also, uh, China's experienced quite a lot of uh, prosperity over the past uh, 20, 30 years. This is GDP since 1980, uh, with the United States, China, and India here. And if you look right around 90, 92, 94, 
right when China is starting to, to gain a bit of speed, that's when a lot of the families that you'll be working with uh, enter the job market. So really, a lot of these families are doing quite well. Um, they've seen a lot of prosperity since they have joined the workforce. And, and, and it also means that a lot of them are newly wealthy. So they grew up with very, very little money, but over their lifetime, or actually they have much more means than their parents have. Also, the one-child policy. Many Chinese families only have one child, though some of the wealthier families do have more than one child. It is a policy, not a law. Um, recently, actually last month, this policy has been changed. Um, in the past, if your mother and father were both only children, you could have two children. Now only one of them needs to have been an only child, and you're able to have two more children. So that will have some interesting effects in, in probably about uh, 15 years for all of us. For our yield discussion today, uh, mom and dad are the decision makers. So at the end of the day, they're making the final decision of where uh, students will, their student will go to school. Motivations. Um, we were just at tabs last week, and I asked the audience, you know, what is the one thing that you want for your child? And all of them said, of course, we're Americans, we said happiness. Um, and then I asked, well, what brings happiness? And then someone said success. And you know, that's exactly what Chinese parents want for their kids. Um, and they see that uh, boarding school education uh, in the United States is a step towards future success. Also, Chinese parents are very conscious of uh, face. Yanzi is how you say it in Chinese. Um, and this is how they project themselves to the outside world or how they're, how they're seen by their peers. Having a child studying abroad shows that, one, they can afford it, and two, that they're also quite progressive when it comes to education. Also diversity. Chinese parents really are not looking for diversity. They're looking for just that classic American education experience. Um, so a lot of them, if a lot of your materials have a lot of Chinese students on it because someone has said, well, it will make them feel more comfortable, they'll feel more welcome. It's not, not exactly true. A lot of them would prefer that it's, it's mostly non-Chinese um, and their child is going to be that only Chinese student at the school. Also, some Chinese chengyu. Chengyu means uh, a saying. And guangzong yaozu, this means to pay respect and to honor one's ancestors. So many, many years ago, um, there was a Wang, there was a Liu, there was a Xu. Uh, the Chinese believed that all of them came from one specific descendant. And everything that they do during this lifetime is in order to pay respect and honor their ancestors, whether it be the very first Wang or uh, their grandparents, great-grandparents, and so forth. So one way to do that is to be highly educated, and I think you can, you can thank Confucius for the, the huge emphasis on education uh, with the Chinese. Um, so this is something they see that does pay respect to one's ancestors. Uh, last motivation, um, this is something that probably should have come first, but student safety is really important to all Chinese parents. When they look at America, they, they feel that it's a very dangerous place uh, with the school shootings, with the Boston bombing that have directly affected Chinese. Um, they, they are worried about sending their children to school here. So this is definitely something right at the beginning to address when you're speaking with parents. Chris? There's challenges. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to speak up a little bit. We have a couple people that are um, having a little difficulty hearing you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so the uh, challenges that they experience here, uh, one is that there's a very, there's a large lack of information in China. So this is uh, the SSAT BA, um, the funny tagline there. Uh, this is where a lot of a lot of people get their information about schools in the United States, um, and a lot of it's just hearsay. So a lot of rumors that go along on here, uh, but the parents really don't have reliable information for for uh, evaluating schools in the United States. The reason being, many of them don't speak English, and once if they don't speak English, then it cuts off a lot of the um, a lot of the information that we provide that actually is factual information. Also, they have a difficulty understanding what the best school is. So uh, when it comes to the idea of the best school, it's very clear cut in China. You have a very clear ranking of schools. Uh, and because of that, uh, 
when they look at the United States and they can't easily find out um, what the quote unquote best school is, it, it makes things a bit more difficult and complicated for them. Um, in, in addition to that, our process for um, applying to schools is actually quite difficult. In China, everything's based on standardized tests. So everything is ranked based on their test scores. That would be the school. It would be uh, the prospects for the next school that you're going to or the university. Uh, but when it comes to the US, we have standardized tests. That's just one little piece. Uh, but we also have teacher recommendations. We have um, um, transcripts. We have personal statements. All these things that are quite different than uh, what they need to have in China. And one of the things that they do is actually they go to our next group here, the agent. Uh, because they can't really find that much information and don't know an awful lot about education in the United States, uh, they seek out people who do. Um, and the agent is somebody who does. Before I get into the conversation, I just want to distinguish between these two parties. One is in education consultants. I'm not talking about them. Two are agents. So education consultants do not collect uh, commissions from the school. Agents do. Education consultants also act more as coaches to prep the students um, and more life skills and help them do their own application materials, whereas agencies do everything for the student and they pay for that service. So the agent profile. Uh, generally, agents in China are pretty young, um, late 20s, early 30s, and they're products of the Chinese education system. So they really haven't had an opportunity to live or study abroad. Most of them have higher ed experience, so they've worked with universities in the past. Uh, this whole idea of secondary school in the United States is a pretty new one. In 2006, TAVS had about 64, this is boarding school specific, had uh, 64 boarding school students from China. And nowadays, it's up around seven, 8,000 that are in just boarding schools. This doesn't include day schools. Um, so a big increase. Um, so because of that, many agencies have pivoted to also include um, secondary school with the services they offer, which basically means they're very new to the market. They don't understand it very well. Also, universities can take 50, 100 kids for one university, whereas we're looking to take just a few. Um, so it's a lot more difficult for them to manage, uh, manage the secondary school market. Generally, they speak very uh, fluent English. They're the ones who are going to be able to interpret everything that schools are saying uh, and information they find online. So um, when you do have an email sometimes from a student and it, it's very strong English and you interview that student and the student doesn't speak English very well, many times you are actually speaking with the uh, agent instead of the actual child over email. For our yield purposes, uh, agents are the decision influencers. So uh, mom and dad hire the agents for their best opinion, but at the end of the day, mom and dad are making um, the final decision. Their motivations, they want to get their clients into the number one school. Whatever that means, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think anybody really does. But uh, they, they find a way to promise this to their families that they're working with. Um, and they really want to get their, their applicants, their clients into the top school because they want to attract business for next year. So if they get little Johnny into a top boarding school or a top day school in the United States, they can advertise that. And Johnny's parents are going to tell their friends, and they're going to put it um, in their office to show, oh, look how successful we are as a company. Also, um, their business model, it's only a piece of it is actually helping the child get into school. A lot of it are the upsell services. So when your office gets completely filled with these view books that have pictures of, of the child from um, you know, being very, very young all the way up until right now when they're 11, 13 years old. Um, this is all upsell services that agencies are, are selling to the students. Also, these are test scores, so um, SAT, GRE, and some IELTS scores here showing how well the students at this particular consultancy, uh, how well they do on tests because of the test prep, and of course, test prep costs additional money. Their challenges. It's extremely competitive in China to be an agent. Uh, there's about 400 that are legally licensed and probably thousands more that are not licensed. Um, it explains why there's a, a lack of professionalism in the field. It's just um, there's a very low barrier to entry. You just have to speak English, really. Um, and what, this, what happens is since the competition becomes so fierce, there's this series of one-upsmanships 
whereas each consultancy is over-promising to someone else uh, what they can deliver. So that's when we have things like money-back guarantees for students. Um, they'll say, well, if you don't get into school, then we will actually refund all of your money. Um, so this is the, the type of promises they have to make just to, to stay in business. Next is the, uh, the square peg in the round hole situation. Uh, this is a challenge faced not only by, by agents, but also from the families and applicants. China's education system is not the same as the United States. And when we require things like teacher recommendations, personal uh, statements, uh, and transcripts, they don't exist in China. So uh, a teacher recommendation, for example, if a system's all based on standardized testing, it doesn't really matter what the teacher thinks of the student. It matters what they get on the test. These teachers have never written teacher recommendations, let alone have written them in English. Also, personal statements, these kids have never written a creative essay in their entire lives because it's not a part of the, the Chinese system. Um, also, to brag about oneself, especially at a young age, uh, is very, uh, is very is viewed, viewed down upon in Chinese culture. And also transcripts, again, standardized testing, it doesn't really matter what grade you get in the class as long as you get a high score on the standardized test. So that's a general overall um, uh, challenge for all of our, our stakeholders. So next, the applicants. Let's look at the students. The first thing to know is that when they want to attend a school in the United States, they're putting all of their chips in the middle of the table, uh, which basically means they will not be allowed to um, return to the Chinese education system after deciding to leave. Uh, the reason, again, being because of standardized testing. Schools want to have the highest standardized test scores because that makes the high school appear makes it a higher ranked school, and their higher ranked school gets better funding, teachers get paid better, the uh, principal will make more money, and also it increases the chances of their students going to top Chinese universities. So when a, when a student leaves, even for a few months, they're a few months behind on, on preparation for standardized testing, and the schools just don't really want them back. Next about applicants, uh, they're the next generation of China. They've grown up only with prosperity. We're seeing students now, they were born in 98, 99, and if you think back to that GDP chart I showed you, it's just been, it, China's been just gangbusters for the past 20 years. Uh, so they really have only seen prosperity in, uh, in China. Also, they have six dependents. So mom and dad, grandma and grandpa on both sides, which they are in charge of supporting um, as, as they all age. China does not have a very good um, insurance or um, life, life insurance uh, market quite yet. It, it's developing, but it's not there. Um, and it's, it's a bit old-fashioned in that it's, it's your, your children are there to support you in your old age. So they do have a lot of pressure to, to perform um, and to do very well and become successful because they will be taking care of um, mom and dad and grandpa and grandpa on both sides. For our purposes today, the student is the decision influencer as well. So they will help persuade mom and dad to make the final decision. Their motivations. There's very, one very high expectations uh, from their family. They want to make sure that they, the student is going into the best school possible so they get into the best university possible, so they get the best job possible, so they make the most money as possible. Um, so this is just the very beginning and a very long chain of events. This is, puts a student under quite a lot of pressure, uh, a pressure cooker, if you will, because they need to be the best. And it's not only for the parents. They also want to do well in front of their peers uh, because their peers likely are also applying to school in the United States. Students are also motivated by prestige. So the mo mo more prestigious the school, the better. Um, this, of course, there's not a list in the United States, uh, but emphasizing anything in your program that is top uh, or the best in the field is, is something that will resonate very well. Also, they're looking for multiple offers. So once you uh, allow your decisions to go out on March 10th, your decision time is over, and then from March 10th to April 10th, it's time for the students to have the choice, and they want to have as many choices as possible. Their challenges. One, as we know, it's extremely competitive to get into schools in the United States, uh, especially in boarding schools and even, even day schools these days. It's getting, it's getting more and more difficult uh, for highly qualified candidates to get in. 
So it's, it's just a very competitive market for them. Next, they are a little unclear about what the school's character means or what it means. You know, we have the benefits of being uh, in the States and we say, oh, well, if this student went to Stanford or this student was at Texas A&M or this student's at NYU, already you have a pretty good idea of what type of student I'm talking about or what personality traits they may have. Whereas Chinese applicants don't have the same luxury, so it's really difficult for them to know, is this the type of school where I'm going to fit in? Also a challenge for them is they don't get to make the final decision. Mom and dad are making the final decision. So that's it for our different profiles here. I'm going to take a really quick look at China strategy just to confirm probably what you suspect, suspect already, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. So the Chinese game plan. Number one, hire a professional. So uh, just like if you were about to make a $300,000, $400,000 investment in the stock market and you don't know anything about the stock market, you're either going to read a lot about it, research it, or you're going to hire a professional to invest that money for you. Um, and this is really where the agents or education consultants come in. So they're going to hire a professional. They're going to apply to six to ten schools. Um, at SAT, there's an average of nine schools that are applied to by Chinese students. I'm not sure where we are with, with, um, with Chinese students for SSAT, but I, I imagine it's probably larger. Uh, next is receive acceptances, hopefully. Then we'll put a deposit at the highest ranked school that, uh, that we have um, been accepted by. Then we'll wait for movement on the waiting list for other schools they've applied to. And if there is movement, you'll forfeit that deposit and attend the higher ranked school. Now this is traditionally what's been happening and what's been really frustrating for a lot of schools. Uh, but there's actually some ways to almost short circuit this or go around this. And that's exactly what Ben's going to talk to you about now. So I'm going to go, go ahead and head it over or hand it over to Ben for the second quarter. All right, everybody. Um, for the second quarter here, we are going to take a quick look at the Chinese admissions and Chinese enrollment from the admissions perspective. Um, I'm assuming that many of you are admissions directors or in the admissions field, uh, maybe incorrectly, but um, we'll kind of move through the second quarter fairly quickly and um, get on to the third quarter, which is really the, uh, the real crux of things and uh, how to influence yield percentage. Um, whoops, went too far. So some of the patterns that we're seeing here in admissions. Um, Chinese uh, admissions activity in the U.S. really started out as a trickle. Um, it was a nice novelty for a very, very long time to have a Chinese student on your campus. It was um, kind of a, a neat badge of honor to have Communist China listed as uh, one of the countries on your country list. Um, right around 2008, uh, the State Department changed its visa policy and that trickle turned into a tidal wave. Fortunately for us, that tidal wave also corresponded with the global economic collapse and it really did help a lot of schools stay open and keep the lights on in the face of some pretty uh, dire uh, economic situations, especially here in the U.S. Um, so it really did help a lot of schools stay solvent move a little forward to today and that tidal wave has turned into a whirlpool. Uh, this whirlpool uh, is a swirling vortex of emails, inquiries, and interview requests that um, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing here at St. James and I've seen at other schools that I've worked at. Um, and it's really overwhelming, uh, especially for small admission staffs at small boarding schools. Um, this vortex has also created um, a little bit of backlash, uh, both internally and externally, where um, different members of the school community internally are, are starting to notice that there are a lot of Chinese students at the school, and also external sources are uh, starting to notice that, such as you know, board members and alumni, and um, probably most specifically, Chinese parents themselves that are, are really wanting their students uh, to, uh, as Chris said earlier, to uh, you know, be one of the very few Chinese students at the school. So schools with a lot of uh, Chinese students in a large population um, and are starting to experience a little bit of external backlash. Um, so 
with, with that being the reality of where we are right now, schools are starting to adjust to this new reality and trying to balance between enough Chinese students but not too many. Uh, we want to make sure that we have enough Chinese students to have cultural exchange, uh, good momentum in the Chinese market, uh, good international diversity on campus and within our international population. And then because Chinese students are almost entirely full pay students, uh, they help drive down the discount rate. And so there is uh, the matter of financial solvency that Chinese students help some schools with. Um, at the same time, we're looking for a few enough Chinese students that boarding schools maintain their exclusivity, uh, especially to continue to be attractive to Chinese parents. Um, we also want to make sure that we have few enough Chinese students that it's, uh, there isn't a barrier towards uh, Western culture immersion and uh, certainly English acquisition. And then lastly, uh, whether it's right or wrong and uh, justified or not, there's also a little bit of uh, Board of Trustees and alumni appeasement there. We, we want to make sure that we're keeping them happy, um, especially as employees of the school. Now, for most schools, um, finding that balance um, based on where the, uh, the current numbers are um, generally means that we have fewer, we're wanting fewer Chinese students overall in our population. And um, in kind of a, a, a weird twist, uh, decreasing the number of Chinese students in our school populations is really increasing the amount of uncertainty in the admissions process when it relates to the Chinese market. Um, if you'll follow with me here just a little bit, there's uh, a little bit of a logic exercise that I went through to, to get to that. Um, but with that, it improved balance for decreasing the number of Chinese students in those schools. And as you decrease the numbers of Chinese students, uh, especially in the face of ever-increasing number of applications, you're really increasing the demand for your school and for spaces in your school. That increase in demand uh, leads to an increase in the quality of the applicants. The increase in the quality of the applicants leads to an increase in competition as they're applying to many other excellent boarding schools just like yours. That increase in competition and decreases the yield because there are so many other schools that are excellent competing for that same student. And then that decrease in yield is what, what is leading to the uncertainty. Despite this uncertainty, of course, we're, we're still being held to uh, very high expectations. School communities are, are constantly desiring the stronger and stronger students within your range of mission appropriate. Um, it, it's, uh, it's really daunting and, it, and another factor too is that as you're in admitting and enrolling fewer Chinese students and, and the Chinese student population is decreasing, if, if there does happen to be a bad decision and a bad admit, uh, a student that maybe um, you know, had somebody else uh, do the interview for them or write their essay for them and you're expecting a certain level of English proficiency and a student uh, shows up in August or September with a lower level of English proficiency, that's going to stand out a lot more in a smaller uh, Chinese population. Um, you know, whereas before you were maybe uh, accepting each year 10 new Chinese students, you know, that one bad admit would only be 10%. Uh, so you'd still have a 90% success rate, but now that maybe you're accepting and enrolling four Chinese students each year, um, that's one in four, and so you're only having a 75% chance success rate, which uh, might have a, a couple of members of your community start looking at you sideways and, and your office sideways. There's also an increased pressure to hit your shots and to really make sure that the students that you accept that you enroll, you're, so you really want to make sure that yield percentage is higher. Um, you, know, you really have to get those students that you accept because uh, obviously you won't get the students that you deny and, and uh, send on their way. Uh, but even if the students that you put on the wait list, those students here uh, being put on the wait list as a no and a no thank you and they'll move on to their next typically highest ranked 
uh, boarding school and accept that, that offer instead of yours and you'll miss out on them and maybe have to reopen the entire uh, Chinese admissions process and potentially get lower quality students. So the, the new reality of Chinese enrollment uh, for boarding schools is really a, an interesting tightrope. Um, you have high expectations on one side, but increased um, uncertainty on the other, and it really leads you to uh, an untenable situation where you're operating without a safety net. So now we're, it's half time, we're, we're on to the, uh, the third quarter, and uh, here at halftime is where um, you know, coaches will take the players back into the locker room, they'll get water, uh, rest up. But the most important part is that the coach sits the players down and um, makes adjustments to what was going on in the first quarter, um, address some issues that, that were happening, what the other team was doing, and come up with a new game plan, and, and a game plan that's really going to um, put the team in the best uh, place to, to have success. Um, and so that's what we're going to move on to now, is uh, what's the game plan moving forward. Um, and before we actually start, I, I do want to point out that uh, throughout this third quarter, I'm going to be really using the words engage and relationships uh, very, very frequently. And those are the, that's the real takeaway uh, from this presentation is that you really have to engage these families, uh, you have to build relationships, and that's what's going to help with your, with your yield per, uh, percentage uh, moving forward. So a, a new game plan. So, so what, what's the game plan? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, any game plan has to have the following uh, factors. First, it has to align with school values, mission, and goals that you have. Um, that, that game plan has to be sustainable, has to be something that you can continue uh, into the future and is for the best of the school. And lastly, it has to give the admissions team the best possible chance of meeting its enrollment goals, both overall enrollment goals, um, international enrollment goals, and then specifically any Chinese enrollment goals that you may have. Um, my, my personal proposal that, um, I, I, that I developed, uh, I locked myself in uh, my office pretty early on in um, my, my job here at St. James, and based on my conversations with the headmaster and the school community, the board of trustees, um, and really understanding the school's overall goals, um, I, you know, Took a, took a stab at trying to create something that was sustainable for the future, um, that was evenly distributed among the grade levels, and you know, it, getting into a situation where we were looking to enroll the same number of Chinese students uh, th that we would graduate in, in June. Um, and you know, th those numbers are you know, relatively soft numbers and general targets. If we were a little higher, a little low, it wasn't the, the end of the world. Um, but we needed something to shoot for, and we needed to know uh, where we were going. Uh, so w once I came up with that plan, I had to move forward and uh, ma make sure I had the key players on board. So my, my first task was to take it to the admissions office, show them, make sure that they were on board with, it, with everything, make sure that I wasn't making a bad assumption, that I wasn't misreading the culture of the school and, and what the goals were. And um, once they were on board and, and they too thought that uh, the, the plan I had was pretty good, I took it to uh, the coaches, I took it to the headmaster, I took it to the board of trustees uh, to get their blessing again, making sure I wasn't misreading their wishes and their desires. Once I got their approval, uh, the next step was actually, um, you know, it's something that's really, really easy to say, um, but it is something that's much more difficult to actually do, and that's to just do it. Just enact the plan and, and make it all happen. Um, so obviously that, that's a pretty tricky thing. In terms of Chinese enrollment, uh, the, in my opinion, the only way that you can effectively enact any kind of a game plan with the goal of improving yield percentage is you have to travel to China. 
you you have to go there. Um, and you know, th there are some boards and, and some headmasters that uh, wonder at the at the logic of going to China every year and spending all of that money to fly there. Um, but it is absolutely vital. Again, you are engaging the families, uh, you're engaging your, your other, the other people that you trust in China and building relationships that are really going to help. And so Chinese travel for admissions purposes has almost shifted, at least in the St. James office, it's shifted from driving the admissions process and, and really being all about um, vetting uh, applicants to make sure we get the best students, and it's almost moved more towards um, a, a really yield trip where we're getting to know the families and, and, uh, and getting to know them face to face. Now, before any, any of you uh, take a trip, there are a couple of things uh, that need to happen. And first of all, you need to have some systems in place. Um, you know, one of the main systems that we use here in, in St. James um, is uh, a, a preliminary interview service. And what this preliminary interview for St. James is an absolutely mandatory aspect uh, of the admissions process just like um, uh, you know, the application or the student essay or um, transcripts or SSAT results. Um, so students have to do this for us um, and if they, if they don't do this then they can't move on and, and ever have a face-to-face -face interview or meeting with us whether that's uh, on campus or while I'm in China or uh, by Skype. Um, what the preliminary interview has really done for St. James is helped us manage the volume um, because we still have a little bit of that tidal wave coming. Um, the, the number of inquiries and applications is still rising. Um, now the tidal wave is still morphing into a whirlpool that's threatening to suck us under, but this is one of our, our main tools that's help, helping us deal with that whirlpool and the, and the number of inquiries and applications. This preliminary interview also really helps us verify language ability with the students. Um, and so this is something where um, we've seen Chinese students get so good at taking tests that their TOEFL scores are um, above 100 and their SSAT scores are, you know, 2200 plus, 2300 plus. And then you get them in front of you uh, either in person or, or by Skype and they're their verbal English doesn't quite match. Uh, this preliminary interview helps you uh, avoid those situations and make sure that the students that you're talking to have the verbal English ability uh, to make it at your school. And that's going to mean different things for different schools. At St. James, we do not have ESL. Um, so students have to be ready to jump into a mainstream English classroom uh, and take chemistry or physics. But um, other schools may have ESL, and so you have to know your own um, you know, you know your own school, know your own program, know what you're good at, and find students supporting you. Um, something else that the preliminary interview really does is it helps us see the student's personality. We get to know, know the students before we ever even fly to China, which is very important. There'll be more on that later. And then lastly, something that I've really enjoyed over the last year and a half that we've been using the service is that every single person in the office is able to see these preliminary interviews. Um, and uh, get a sense of the student, uh, his or her English ability, their personality, what, they're, what they like, what they dislike, things like that. And extremely valuable. Before this, the only person that really had any idea was who, whoever interviewed uh, the student. And the rest of the admissions committee would have to pretty much take that one person's word. Now we can have every single person that's sitting around that, uh, the decision-making table watch these interviews and really get a good sense of who the person is and what their personality is like and really put a face and personality to the name. So it's been very good for us with that and it really helps um, uh, a, a lot of things uh, within the office and so it helps us get to know these students uh, for February decisions. Now once you've looked at all of your uh, students and you're moving into uh, actual planning your, your trip and where you're going to go, I would strongly suggest that you follow the data. Uh, look, at the, look at where your inquiries, applications, uh, preliminary interviews uh, are all coming from. You would also probably want to check out where your alumni base is, uh, where your current parents are located, 
and uh, really uh, lean on them and uh, direct your travel around those people because they're going to be immensely helpful uh, as you travel around China. Once you've established your itinerary, um, you're going to go ahead and target those very top applicants. And you'll know who those top applicants are from the, um, from the application that you have and also from uh, the preliminary interviews. And so once you have those top targets, um, you're going to really start to engage them and build those uh, relationships early. So there's the engagement. <laughs> Um, so now you're, you're flying to China, you, you've done all of your preliminary uh, planning and you're having, uh, your, your boots are on the ground, ni hao, you are uh, in China and uh, one of the main things that you're going to want to do is uh, engage with your trusted partners. And for me, trusted partners in China are people that obviously I really, really trust, uh, but I trust them to give me students and send students to me that uh, fit the ethos of the school, that have the English ability, that have the personality, and also have the desire to be at St. James. Um, so these trusted partners uh, can be educational consultants, um, and the educational consultants for me that are trusted partners are the only consultants that I will actually uh, travel to and visit their offices and give presentations. Um, uh, other consultants uh, and uh, their students and everybody will have to come see me at my hotel. Um, other trusted partners would be alumni in the area and current parents that, that are all very good referral sources and can send students to you. Also, while I'm in China, I am uh, starting to prepare for my interviews. Um, I, I re-watch all of my preliminary videos, uh, or pre preliminary interview videos, to make sure that uh, I remember the students and uh, can make a great first impression because I'll recognize them across the crowded hotel hallway. Um, I uh, will know about them. I'll be able to have some uh, more strategic uh, questions where I'm really searching for information instead of just trying to get to know the in, the uh, applicants on a very surface level. And speaking of the interviews, um, I, I really make sure to schedule long interviews and for me that's roughly an hour per interview. Um, I know there are a lot of other folks that will do much shorter interviews, but I don't want my interviews to feel rushed. Um, I want to make sure that not only do I get all of my questions answered uh, by the students and the parents, but I want to make sure that the students and parents are asking me all of the questions that they have at that time. Um, you know, we, we need to remember, sh remember who the decision makers are and who the decision influences are, um, and their questions a lot of times can give more information to us uh, than the answers that they give to our own questions. And so during that interview, uh, as I'm asking questions and as I'm, you know, again, more importantly, listening to their questions and, and answering myself, I am keeping my antenna up. Uh, keep, keeping your antenna up is an old sales terms, meaning you know, listening to your customer, uh, understanding his or her hopes and dreams and fears and uh, questions and all of that so that you can address those and move forward and uh, in the sales jargon, you know, make a sale. Um, so this is really what I'm doing during this whole um, period during the interview because uh, I, I really want to use that information to engage my rock stars. So after meeting with the, my top targets face to face, I get a, a much better feeling of who the exact students are that I would just love to enroll. Um, you know, if I could do it right away in November, I would love to be able to do that. Um, so with these rock stars, I'm very, very diligent about um, using the data and the information that I got from keeping my antenna up and using that to um, engage with the uh, students and their family and the educational consultant for timely follow-up. I want to say you know, thank you for interviewing. Here are some answers to the questions that um, I didn't have. Here's um, you know, a, a link to one of the programs that you were uh, interested in uh, during our interview, things like that. So you definitely want to stay uh, in touch with the student. You also want to make sure that you're staying engaged with the family themselves. Um, I think you probably all know that you can tell a student one thing and, 
and ask them to tell their parents, and when it, it finally gets to the parents, it's something completely different if it gets there at all. And so I actually route a lot of my communication through the parents, so uh, the parents know that, that the student and I have this great re relationship, and I, I'm very interested in the student, and that will help the decision makers uh, understand the, the quality of the relationship that we have. Um, it is also important that you don't forget the educational consultant as a decision influencer and certainly keep them in the loop as well. And with these communications, you want to make sure that you keep it simple and keep it very real. You don't want to go into long convoluted um, creations uh, that, uh, that students can see through as being pretty fake. Um, and one example that I just had uh, recently on my last trip to China is one of my students was uh, taking an engineering class after school and uh, he was about ready to have a competition for spaghetti bridges and so they were building spaghetti bridges with spaghetti and Elmer's glue and then seeing how much weight they could could hold. Um, I made a note in my calendar that uh, of when the competition was and on that next day I shot him a quick email and said hey John uh, hope you're doing well I know you had your competition last night how did it go? Um, and that very very simple email that was very very real um, elicited a massive response and he told me in painstaking detail, blow by blow, how the competition went. And so it was something that, that I think, I hope, went a long way in creating a good relationship. And to make all of this worth it, uh, you know, this is a lot of time, a lot of effort. You have to make sure you take all of this data into the decision-making process. Uh, there is a massive uh, number of high-quality applicants and it's difficult to tell what they're going to do. And so what you need to do is you need to lean on your established relationships. And so you're leaning on and talking to the family um, and getting a sense of what they think. Um, they, they probably will, will lie to you and tell you, of course, you're their number one choice. Um, but you have to read between the lines a little bit with the, the quality of the communication, the frequency of the communication with both the parents and the student. Um, you also can lean on your trusted partners, uh, the educational consultants, alumni in the area, current parents will all be able to give you uh, good information as to you know, how the student is feeling about you and your school. Another thing that, that I stumbled into a little bit was uh, using spies. Uh, this uh, pretty young lady's name is Coco and she is a St. James spy. She jumps on those message boards that Chris was showing you earlier to get a sense of what students are saying about St. James um, and whether or not they are excited about being accepted, whether they're thinking about whether they've been accepted to other schools and are thinking about deferring, just giving us a lot of information that will kind of let us know what we need to do uh, moving forward. And so with all of this information, you can develop a pretty good gut feeling and take that gut feeling to the admissions committee. Um, you need to use that gut feeling uh, during the committee. We, we uh, certainly read through all the applicants and come up with a relational ranking, but then we also include this gut feeling and how strong of a chance we think we have on yielding the student. And that plays a role in uh, not only who we, uh, who we accept, but also how many students that we accept. If our number one choice is a uh, you know, it's a little bit iffy, we'll probably accept our number two choice that maybe it has a, as well that might have a higher yield number so that we're, we're sure that we get the one or two students that we're looking for. So at the end of the day, um, your success here in China in, in, uh, in on improving your Chinese yield is really going to hinge on your preparation ahead of time, the amount of data collection that you can do um, both in your office and while you're traveling to China and the level of engagement that you have, which leads to the quality of the relationships that, that you create uh, during the course of the admissions uh, cycle at the beginning. And then it's also important to, to realize that the acceptance is just the first half of the game. Uh, the second half is the, the yield phase, uh, so uh, March through April, stay in contact with the, with the students and, and, and the parents and make sure that you keep loving them up. You want to keep treating them just as you would a mission-appropriate, full-pay domestic border applicant. So uh, give them a lot of love and make them feel special. special. All right. Chris, Leo, anything to add there? 
let's see. We probably just open it up for the key. No, I think uh, I think Ben. Yeah, I think Ben, uh, you covered it all. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty much what we all think. The only thing I would add is going back to one issue. Make sure you create a sense of selectivity, which you all are anyway. Um, once you start compromising on your, you know, how your process will work because you're suddenly worried about filling that last bed, that goes out there. Everybody over in China knows that. Do not compromise. Do not compromise on how your process works. Do not let them tell you that they just can't get to the TOEFL right now because they're just so busy or the SSAT score. Don't let the consultant do an end around and go through some family friend who says they just arrived and they only got 25 minutes to see you on campus. You hold the line even if you have to lose that candidate because the word goes out that you're not selective. Once you create a sense of selectivity, which you all are, then they will pay attention. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, I'd like to get to the Q&A at this point. Um, gentlemen, someone's asking, how do you begin? Where do you begin this process? You're starting to get an, an influx of, of Chinese applications. What's your first step, and, and how do you start your process? I'm going to start with that one. First of all, have an in-house um, process. In other words, have a, have a de design a plan on how you're going to manage the applications, who's going to answer the questions, how you're going to handle the emails. We actually have some canned emails that automatically go out. We have a plan on who we're not going to Anybody who sends an email to us that says, um, tell us everything that they already know is on, that they can find on the website, then we don't even respond and say, just look at our website. You have to have a plan in-house on how to manage all this. If you don't have that plan, you're going to be overwhelmed. Gentlemen, what do you think? Well, I definitely agree. If, um, you know, if, if you don't have those pre-existing plans in place right away, um, then kind of the, the nature of an admissions person is to be very helpful. And um, you, you, you end up an answering questions over and over and over again if, if you don't have um, Th those processes in place. And so uh, obviously make sure you have a lot of those questions answered already on your website and uh, have a, a handy link that you can send to students, families, educational consultants and the like um, to point them to those answers. Let, let me just add to that because all of you out there know we're all focused on the domestic borders. And if you spend all your time answering all these questions, um, that need, they can be answered by them going to the website. You're staying off the mark of your goal. You have to go after your domestic apple. They need attention. You're spending all your time in your office, and we've, we've struggled with this over the past five years, with these kinds of emails, these kinds of consultant emails. Um, if you're spending too much time responding because you feel bad that you need to respond in a personal way, forget it. You have to stay focused on your domestic so the, cons the, the 15, 20 consultant emails we get per day get very little attention from us. Um, the, the person who asks 10 different questions that all answer on the website get very little attention from us. I know it sounds harsh, but you have to stay focused on your domestic applicants. These other families, if they're really interested, will get to you in a more appropriate way. OK, thank you. Um, I've had a comment uh, regarding Chinese students who are currently at uh, junior boarding schools and uh, the use of placement directors. Can you uh, perhaps address that? I have the greatest confidence personally in the placement directors at these great junior boarding schools. I, I much rather talk to them than the agent who surreptitiously uh, uh, representing these kids. When I go to the schools, the great junior boarding schools like you know, like we go to Rumsey Hall or Indian Mountain, Eagle Brook, I know that they're going to be credible. And I know that when they tell me this is a great kid and the kid is really interested in our school, I can take that to, to the bank. And so I really very much appreciate these great placement directors. And I would much rather work with them than with consultants, which I don't really work with um, over there. They, I'd much rather take, a, quite frankly, a top-level Chinese student from a great junior boarding school. I know what the preparation is, and I know the recommendations will be uh, strong and will be objective, and I'd much rather work with those places. Right? 
Ben? Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I uh, absolutely agree. I think that's a, um, a, a major bonus if, uh, <laughs> if you're talking to uh, a, a Chinese family that has their son or daughter at a junior boarding school. Um, and like Leo said, you have faith in the transcript, you have faith in the teacher recommendations, you uh, know that they are away from home and existing in a boarding life, and so that transition will be a little bit easier. Um, and just know that it's a rigorous preparation and that, uh, that students are getting uh, a certain level of attention and that they're being held to certain ex expectations um, that are then consistent with what we have in our own programs. Oh, well, just let me add to that. Dude. What a lot of these kids will do is, while they have placement directors who are probably in better position to place them, they, these parents will get agents over in China. And when I find out that they're dealing with an agent in China, and I'm also dealing with a placement director, I call the placement director and I say, hey, just so you know, this parent's being represented by another group. And they will say, we know this, Leo. And I'm going to say, I'll tell the parents, I'm going to be leaning on the placement director. I'm not going to pay attention to the consultant. I'm leaning on the placement director. That's who I want to work with. That's where the recommendations are coming from. If you want to work with an agent over there, you need to know that we're still going to go back and spend our time with the placement director. And he's the one, and she's the one that we're going to listen to at the end of the day. OK, thank you. Um, Jared is asking if you have any information, either uh, data or anecdotal, to support the claim that relationships are vitally important to the Chinese. Uh, in other words, when visiting, did you see uh, an increase in applications or yield? <laughs> of course. Yeah. I, think, I think Ben said it better than I could. I mean, you're not developing relationships. These, at the end of the day, these are families. What, 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 what binds all of us around the world is our parents' love for the children. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. You spend time with that parent and that child and focus on what's important and talk about what's important and develop the relationship. I love what, what Ben is saying about how he does it. That's golden. You can't go over and treat them like they're some distant kind of culture that has no connection to what is really important. It's about their children. You develop a relationship with that family. You, you spend time, particularly the children you're truly are interested in, you're going to yield that candidate. Okay, what do you think? No, absolutely. I, I think uh, one of the main things that um, that I, I make sure that my admissions officers all remember is that uh, these Chinese families, by and large, are sending their only son or only daughter uh, thousands of miles away, often by themselves on airplanes and uh, and transfers and all kinds of things, just to come to your boarding school. And you know, with with that in mind, I mean, I. I would be absolutely petrified of sending my seventh grade daughter uh, over to China to go to a boarding school if I didn't meet anyone over there face to face and really um, get a good sense of what that one person was all about and that that one person was a good person. Um, I would need that kind of touchstone. Um, something else that, that, that really works well is um, using your Chinese parents uh, as relationship builders, the, those, uh, the current parents. Um, having them contact the other families uh, of, of the students that you've accepted um, really helps. Um, again, if you put yourself in their shoes and you're sending your son or daughter to China, um, it would make you feel much better about sending your, your student to School A if um, an American parent from School A called you and said, man, my son has had an awesome experience. Um, I can't wait to send my daughter to uh, School A. Uh, your kid's going to love it. Um, that's going to make me feel so much better that I'm not the only person doing this. Um, and so establishing those relationships is absolutely vital. I think going back to this is not rocket science. This is what the, the same way you operate with the domestic candidates. The parents and you develop a relationship. They feel that, that you represent that kind of uh, quality about your school, one that's personal, which all you boarding schools are. And that's golden. So this isn't rocket science. You don't need data. There it is. It's just the way we deal with any kind of relationship, whether it be a school or a business, whatever. It's all about the relationship at the end of the day. You get the test scores, you get the personal essays, it's all about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I just add on that, is, um, relationships are really the key to what drives Chinese society. So there's one of the first words you learn when you speak Chinese is guanxi, which means relationship. 
and it basically extends to your family, your friends, and your business acquaintances. And outside of that circle, nothing really matters. It matters with what's in that circle. So you do want to, you want to be there. One last anecdote since the person asked about it. Two years ago, we yielded a wonderful Korean girl, a gifted, gifted, gifted cellist, and my good friend who she decided not to go to his school said, how did you get that candidate? I said, I talked about cello. I, I talked about cello. I know music. I was in an orchestra. I talked about cello. I didn't talk about anything else. I didn't talk about our winning lacrosse team or our wonderful math program. The girl was interested in cello. We talked cello for all day. You know, we get into the whole thing about Brahms cello suite, and the whole thing. And she came. And he said, oh, the girl loved cello. We talked cello. Hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to address one more thing before we uh, before we sign off, and I apologize if there's any static or feedback. Uh, I've noticed some uh, as we've been speaking, so uh, to our attendees, I apologize if you're getting some feedback. Uh, gentlemen, I've had a couple of questions about the preliminary interview. Um, people would like some more details about it. Who is it that conducts it? Is it a video that the kid sends in? Um, could you speak a little bit more to the details of the preliminary interview? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll open that up and then maybe uh, shift it over to Leo and uh, more specifically to Chris. The, um, the preliminary interview service that I use is Varican. It is Chris's company. Um, you know, and, and Chris and I and Leo were very specific in you know, not wanting this to be a, a long commercial for Varican. But um, you know, it, it's really an amazing service. It's a completely third-party uh, service. Their only role is to verify the applicant, um, do a about 10-minute taped face-to-face uh, uh, -face interview with one of their interviewers. Um, and then there's also a writing sample that they make available to you. Um, you know, there, there's some other features that Chris can talk about or Leo can talk about. But um, I've been using it for about a year and a half. And it has been an absolute game game changer for me here at St. James. I couldn't be happier. Yeah, I, th I think for us, we we were there from the beginning of Barricade. And again, we're not a show for one company, but it's the only company doing it at this level. But for us, I mean, for example, already by this time, we've already seen over 100 of these things. My whole team, as Ben said earlier, your whole team gets to watch them. And then we decide if this is a candidate that we're going to invite for a second interview. Um, and what's helpful with that is, if I do that before I get to China, I know now to go get beyond the typical, hello, how are you, where are you from kind of nonsense, and they get into the specifics. The, the Varican interview is not there to evaluate the candidate. They're not there to get the kid's life history. It's a very professionally done interview, but we're the ones who make the decision. But it's allowed me to drill the pool down to the candidates I truly want to see. I go to China. I spend time with those candidates. I know what to talk about. I know I'm very interested in some cases. There's some that I look at on that very and say, I really, really want to talk to this kid. And then suddenly I'm able to develop the relationship a lot quicker. When I'm in China, I'm not like Ben. I can't do one hour interviews. You know, I'm doing like 10 a day. And that's enough for me at my age. And so what I do is I go in, it's a half hour, but I know what to talk about. So I've eliminated the 15 minutes of getting to know the child. Um, I can't imagine doing it without this kind of program. If someone else comes up with a better one, fine. But I can't imagine doing this without some kind of preliminary. It's the only way you're going to cull this field, the only way that you're going to be able to manage it. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're going to be scheduling interviews in your office. The kid's going to show up, and the kid does not have the skills for your school, does not have the, is not a good match for your school. So it, it's, you, just, you don't have enough time for that. Remember, you can't have 10. Chinese kids touring your school in, in, in the morning. You've got to have time for your domestic kids. How do you cut through that pool in January? As you say, very specific. If you do not do a very can interview, we will, and we, we do not approve your second level, you, you don't get an interview with our school. And it works out well for us. And it goes back to my point of creating a sense of selectivity. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I couldn't say better than, than both of you. I mean, both of you use use the service. So I think it's best um, you know, best explained by by you two. But I would say, if there's any other questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email my email address is right there in the middle. And, and additionally, I would say reach out to either Ben or, or Leo for more information as well, since they they use the service. 
Okay, I think that's, that about wraps it up for today. Um, I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and a special thank you to Chris, Ben, and Leo for providing us with this insightful webinar. Just a reminder, a recording of this presentation will be made available on the webinar page in the professional development section on admission.org. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day.